Hello and welcome, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are Ammon, Topa, and Micah, and together we are the Three Brothers. And we welcome you once again to this week's Come Follow Me discussion, where we will give you our favorite insights and then we'll talk about them. That is what we do here, brothers and sisters. And as always, everything we talk about is free. You can follow the links provided below to get uh, both our th our insights paper that we're going to talk about and also the weekly weedings. You'll find that linked below. Uh, the weekly weedings is highly recommended that you give that a, a weed. Um, it is <laughs> this week's Come Follow Me uh, scriptures, which are in gold. Uh, we combined with the Come Follow Me manual in black and also the other church manuals in purple. And it's all in order and nicely structured by Ashley. And we much appreciate it. And it's a fantastic way to study the uh, the week's weedings. And so we do highly recommend you to give that a crack. And you'll also find the insights that we discuss um, there as well. Uh, Ashley also uh, records, reads through that that paper um, and records it and puts it on our YouTube channel as well if you prefer to listen. So you'll find that there as well. And that's what we do. Let's do it. Without any further what 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 weeding. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Ammon's insight number one team, Alma 43. The following passage I thought was really interesting and made me made me really think this week. And now, as Moroni knew the intention of the Lamanites, that it was their intention to destroy their brethren, or to subject them and bring them into bondage, that they might establish a kingdom unto themselves over all the land. And he also knowing that it was the only desire of the Nephites to preserve their lands and their liberty and their church. Therefore, he thought it no sin that he should defend them by stratagem. Therefore, he found his spies, which by his spies, which caused the Lamanites' work to take. So, as I was pondering this use of stratagem, strategy, in order to protect the lives of these righteous people, first thing that popped into my head was how stratagem was used during during the American Civil War, or not Civil War, the American Revolutionary War, in particular. Um, beginning at the battles of Lexington and Concord, the Continental Army utilized guerrilla warfare against the British. Raids, ambushes, and spreading disinformation were just some of the ways through which the Americans were able to surprise larger British forces. Now, I've watched the movie The Patriot maybe more times than I, it is appropriate to state here. <laughs> I don't know, a dozen or so times. I watched it a lot. It is... One of my favorite movies of all time. Absolutely love that movie. And every single time I watch it, I guarantee you guys are the same as me if you've seen it. You put yourself, you always try and put yourself in the position of like a continental US soldier or the character that, that Mel Gibson portrayed. And you want to think like, who would I be in this scenario? H how would I feel, you know, when people are trying to take away my freedom and, you know, attack my family and, we're, we're only in the defense of our people and our country and all that sort of stuff. And then I think sometimes to myself, <clears throat> would I be comfortable with using strategic means to fight against the British? Would I be justified in the eyes of the Lord? And then I remembered what they were fighting for, their wives, their families, their freedoms. The Lord justifies the righteous in the use of strategy when defending the innocent. In the student manual this week, it says... It is clear from these and other writings that there are times and circumstances when nations are justified, in fact, have an obligation to fight for family, for liberty, and against tyranny, threat, and oppression. It makes me think of the Revolutionary War, World War II, you know, stuff like that. Now, here's a really cool story I thought I'd just share with you guys. You, pro you probably heard it before. Maybe you haven't, but... It's called. It's taken from the Journal of Discourses by President Brigham Young. It's called Bo Bogus Brigham Joke Story. It says, while Brother George A. Smith was referring to the circumstance of William Millard going to Carthage, it brought to my mind reflections of the past. Perhaps to relate the circumstance as it occurred would be interesting. 
I do not profess to be much of a joker, but I do not think I do think it was one of the best jokes ever perpetrated. By the time we were at work in the Nauvoo Temple, officiating in the audiences, the mob had learned that Mormonism was not dead, as they had supposed. We had completed the walls of the temple and the attic story from about halfway up the first windows in about 15 months. It went up like magic, and we commenced officiating in the ordinances. Then the mob commenced to hunt for other victims. They had already killed the prophets Joseph and Hiram in Carthage jail while under the pledge for their state, for their safety, and now they wanted Brigham, the president of the, of the Twelve Apostles, who were, were then acting as the presidency of the church. I was in my room at the temple. It was the southeast corner of the upper story. I learned that a posse was lurking around the temple and that the United States Marshal was waiting for me to come down, whereupon I knelt down and asked my Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, to guide and protect me that I might live to prove advantageous to the saints. Just as I arose from my knees and sat down in my chair, there came a rap at my door. I said, come in. And Brother George D. Grant, who was then engaged driving my carriage and doing chores for me, entered the room. He said, Brother Young, do you know that a posse and the United and the United States Marshal are here? I told him I had heard so. On entering the room, Brother Grant left the door open. Nothing came into my mind what to do, until looking directly across the hall, I saw Brother William Miller leaning against the wall. As I stepped towards the door, I beckoned him. He came. Said I to him, Brother William, the marshal is here for me. Will you go and do just as I tell you? If you will, I will serve them a trick. I knew that Brother Miller was an excellent man, perfectly reliable and capable of carrying out my project. Said I, here, take my cloak. But it happened to be Brother Heber C. Kimball's. Our cloaks were alike in color, fashion, and size. I threw it around his shoulders and told him to wear my hat and accompany Brother George D. Grant. He did so. I said to Brother Grant, George, you step into the carriage and look towards Brother Miller and say to him, as though you were addressing me, are you ready to ride? You can do this, and they will suppose Brother Miller to be me and proceed accordingly, which they did. Just as Brother Miller was entering the carriage, the marshal stepped up to him and placing his hand on his shoulder said, you are my prisoner. Brother William entered the carriage and said to the marshal, I'm going to the mansion house. Won't you ride with me? They both went to the mansion house. There were my sons, Joseph A., Brigham Jr., and Brother Heber C. Kimball's boys and others who were looking on, and all seemed at once to understand and partake of the joke. They followed the carriage to the mansion house and gathered around Brother Miller with tears in their eyes saying, Father, or President Young, where are you going? Brother Miller looked at them kindly but made no reply and the marshal really thought he had got Brother Brigham. Lawyer Edmonds, who was then staying at the mansion house, appreciated the joke, volunteered to Brother Miller to go to Carthage with him and see him safe through. When they arrived within two or three miles of Carthage, the marshal with his posse stopped. They arose in their carriages, buggies and wagons, and like a tribe of Indians going into battle, or as if they were a pack of demons, yelling and shouting, they exclaimed, We've got him! We've got him! When they reached Carthage, the marshal took the supposed Brigham into an upper room of the hotel and placed a guard over him, at the same time telling those around that he had got him. Brother Miller remained in the room until they bid him come to supper. While there, parties came in, one after the other, and asked for Brigham. Brother Miller was pointed out to them. So it continued, until an apostate Mormon by the name of Thatcher, who lived in Nauvoo, came in, sat down, and asked the landlord where Brother, Brother Brigham Young was. The landlord, pointing across the table to Brother Miller, said, that is Mr. Young. Thatcher replied, where? I can't see anyone that looks like Brigham. The landlord told him that that fat, fleshy man eating. Oh, hell, exclaimed Thatcher. That's not Brigham. That's William Miller, one of my old neighbors. Upon hearing this, the landlord went and tapping the sheriff on the shoulder, took him a few steps to one side and said, you've made a mistake. That is not Brigham Young. It is William Miller of Nauvoo. The marshal, very much astonished, exclaimed, good heavens and he passed for Brigham. He then took Brother Miller into a room and, turning to him, said, What in hell is the reason you did not tell me your name? Brother, uh, Brother Miller replied, You have not asked me my name. Well, said the sheriff with another oath, What is your name? My name, he replied, is William Miller. Said the marshal, I thought your name was Brigham Young. Do you say this for a fact? Certainly I do, said Brother Miller. Then, said the marshal, why did you not tell me this before? I was under no obligations to tell you, replied Brother Miller. 
as you did not ask me. Then the marshal, in a rage, walked out of the room, followed by Brother Miller, who walked off in company with lawyer Edmonds, Sheriff Barkenstoss, and others, who took him across a lot to a place of safety. And this is the real pith of the story of Bogus Brigham, as far as I can recollect. So, yeah, just from that story, just a if Brigham thought it was the funniest joke he's ever heard, but had had Brigham not used a little bit of strategy there, he probably would have been locked up, not been able to finish the work in the temple, and maybe worse. They just killed Joseph and Hiram. They probably would have killed him too. Abraham had a bit of a pickle like this. Abraham was following the guidance of the Lord and was led down into Egypt. In Genesis chapter 12, and there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass that when he was come near unto Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well for me for, for thy sake and my soul shall live because of thee. Now, in the student manual, it says that Abraham could validly state that Sarai, Sarah or Sarai was his sister. In the Bible, the Hebrew word brother and sister are often used for other brother blood relatives. And because Abraham and Haran, Sarah's father, were brothers, Sarah was Abraham's niece and thus could be called sister. Another ancient custom might shed light on the relationship permitted a woman to be adopted as a man's sister upon their marriage to give her greater legal and social status. Even though Abraham was correct in calling her his sister, he did receive the Egyptians. How can this action be justified? The answer is very simple. His action was justified because God told him to do it. And this next paragraph is really the crux of this matter. The prophet Joseph Smith taught the following, that which is wrong under one circumstance may be, and often is, right under another. God said, thou shalt not kill. At, at another time, he said, thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted, by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. Since God is perfect and does not do anything that is not right, Abraham's act was not wrong. Nice. Yeah, cool, cool stories. Um, yeah, so in particular, in relating this to this week, as you've done, um, war, war's, war's a funny thing. Uh, it's not funny. Um, it's an interesting thing. Um, but And I, I think I talk about this in one of my insights, but to me, it's about intention, you know, uh, a lot of it is about in intention and I believe as to why the Lord has clearly always been with the allies, if you will say, you know, and, um, you know, things like World War II and things like this, why there was like clear times when the Lord guided um, the allies to victory. It's because of the intention, uh, you know, it, if we're talking about the um, re the revolutionary war um you know america america's fighting for freedom from tyranny um if we're talking you know the civil war even they're fighting to abolish slavery if we're talking um world war ii you know they're again defending freedom defending those who can't defend themselves from from you know from the germans who are trying to just take over the whole world you know it's like what what's your intention what are you fighting for and then if we look at moroni He's clearly fighting for for good stuff. He's fighting for liberty, for his family, for freedom, and for freedom of religion. All good things, you know. So it's like, what's your stance? What's your intention? And I think that is clearly linked to, um, firstly, whether the Lord will help you, and secondly, if the Lord is helping you and you're doing the right thing, it's like almost anything goes. Do you know what I mean? Like seriously, um, and I, what what's Interesting too is there's many many quotes this week from the manuals where um, church leaders basically say you know not only is it um, you know in times of war you know you're going to have to probably kill for your country and not only is that okay uh, it's it's 
uh, expected, basically, that you will rise to meet the call to defend your your freedom, you know, your liberty and um, your sovereign nation. Very interesting. And um, <clears throat> another thing with Moroni, and I think I, I mentioned this briefly in one of my insights as well, is that one of the first things that Moroni does when they're when the Lamanites are coming upon them is he asks Alma for guidance as well. He goes to the prophet and he goes, what, what would the Lord have us do? You know, and he gets all the inside goss and like, and he, and he trusts him too. Like, absolutely trust him. Okay. And, and then Alma comes back with, look, they're going to go through here. They're going to attack Manti. I think it was one of the weaker cities, you know, they know what's weak, you know, they, you know, half of them being um, ex Nephites. Um, and so they get this stratagem, they get this, you know, sort of inside, um, you know, strategy and plan because the Lord is willing to help them because of the reason for what they are fighting for. Um, again, so it's like your intention, what, you know, what, what side of the thing are you on? Um, and it, to me, it also kind of links to the covenant that like, especially in America, which again is what we're really talking about here mostly is, is the, um, the covenant that's upon the land, you know, if you're, if you're righteous, you'll prosper. And if you're not righteous, you'll be utterly destroyed essentially. Um, and that kind of links to this. If you're trying to be righteous, the Lord almost has to help the Americans win. Like it's as, kind of as simple as that. Um, and just lastly, uh, I, I, I also mentioned this briefly in one of my things, but I'll just mention it now instead because your last quote there, um, about what Joseph Smith said, and I think that's very interesting as well. Um, about God, God, you know, sometimes will say, "Thou shalt not kill," and then other times he say, he says, "Thou shalt utterly destroy." And it is very interesting. There, there is a difference between killing and murder, right? You know, murder is is like like a like a planned killing of, of your own sort of choice or whatever of, of someone. But if the Lord deems you need to kill someone. You know, let's let's say, if, for instance, uh, in defense of your country, your sovereign nation, or whatever, and your liberty, and your religion, and your whatever, that's not murder. It's killing. It's not murder, though. Um, and for instance, if Nephi is commanded to chop the head of Laban off because a whole nation will dwindle in unbelief, otherwise, uh, it's not murder. You know, he had to kill someone to to make that happen, but it's not a crime. It's not a sin. So again, it's what the Lord deems important and necessary and your intention and um again because you're just trying to be obedient to the lord and to his commandments and or uh defending your your nation you know so um yeah anyway it's very interesting cool stories um and I, but again i think it's a lot about intention yeah yeah nephi nephi is definitely going to get brought up a lot huh with with the uh, the the killing or does get brought up a lot with the the killing or some people will say murder but it's not you know I was actually um I, I'm not a as people know I'm not a huge fan of all the like people that like to <laughs> seem to just stay in the old Hebrew and you know what what things used to say but I think that that one is one of the ones that really actually is useful for people to understand where we 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 constantly say thou shalt not kill thou shalt not kill and uh, i i've heard multiple um jewish uh individuals talk about that and they're like you know by, by the way the 10 commandments like we still believe in that as jews right and so like this is this is something that we still teach and we don't like it when christians keep saying thou shalt not kill thou shalt not kill because that's not actually the word that's used and uh it's a completely different word and the word that's actually used there whatever it is you know i'm sure it's something like roshka or whatever you know that i have no idea how to pronounce but it, it's an unjustified taking of a life of a human person so the, the concept being it's unjustified there's no justice or justifiable reason to take the person's life and uh so once again uh with nephi what is the spirit doing t with with nephi before he actually kills him. He's justifying the killing. That's literally what he's doing. He's going through the process of saying this isn't an unjustified killing, Nephi. These are the, the reasons why this, this killing is actually justified. And if you'll notice what Nephi actually says here, he says he doesn't say, oh, no, I'm told that I can't shed the blood of anybody. He says, I shrank because up to that point in time, I hadn't yet 
shed the blood of a man. So it wasn't even like it was something that like was uncommon or it was no, I just up until that point in time, I hadn't had to make the decision between a justified kill or not. And I think that um, at the heart of, of Ammon's point here uh, or insight here, which was awesome is the concept of that. We have to understand of the, the, the standard or norm versus the exception, which once again, what do we focus on? Like, what is it that we always focus on? And, and the focus is always on the norm, right? Follow the prophet. The norm is always be obedient. The norm is always these things. It, are there, the, the norm is not, you know, as it says, thou shalt utterly destroy. That's not the norm, right? That's, that's, the, that's the unnorm. And so, you know, when you get into these points in time, and that's why it's so important to follow the keys as, as um as uh, Topher said there because like in Moroni in times of war it's not the norm you want the norm to be peace and so what do you have to do you got to go to Alma you got to go to the keys and say okay these aren't normal times i need help right i need guidance to help me go through this and there are times where the lord will say hey thou shalt be utterly destroyed and then there'll be other times where the lord will say you need to bend the knee and you need to take the vax and and you know what? If you're the type of person that glorifies and says, yeah, I'm going to pick up the sword and murder. I'm going to kill a bunch of people. And then when they say, nope, OK, now it's time to bend the knee. You're like, no, never. I'm going to, you know, you know what you've just shown about yourself is you're somebody who glories in blood. You're the person you're not following the keys. You're not trying to do what's right. You're simply just somebody who likes to likes to lie and to make a lie, right? And so another example of that was Elijah, right? Elijah with the, you know, being fed by the raven or whatever. A lot of people don't know this part of the story or talk about it a lot, but he was like, hey, I want to go back and lay this down right now. And the Lord was like, no, 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 no. Go off into the woods, right? Go off into the desert and hide for a while. And, and I think that um, we, and he did it. And so uh, I think that we need to understand the difference between and and what we really want, you know, because I'll tell you what, it was a humbling experience for me, right? In 2020 or whenever that happened to to, to be told to bend the knee. Um, and uh, it, and what I, you need to be willing to do is whatever the Lord requires, because whatever the Lord requires is right. And if that's to 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 not give all the information and make them think I'm Brigham Young, so be it, Right. If, if, if it's, you know, X, Y, and Z, so be it. If it's like Joseph Smith that I'm going to go as a lamb to the, the slaughter, so be it. I might not like the answer, right? I might not like the answer, but uh, uh, we, we, need to, we need to do what we're called upon to do. So. Yeah, and don't, don't pick and choose which one of those we're going to do, you know, which one we're happy about and which one, you know, we just do what the Lord says, yeah. You know, because some might be happy that they get to go to war, you know, and, and and love that part of it. And it's easy to do that, you know, because they love it. But, you know, when it comes to something else, they'll, you know, begrudgingly do it because they don't want to do it. You know, it's not up to us to to to, to judge it, to make that call. And, you know, today, today, I think it's actually a, a little bit backwards. I think, like, if you go back to the first redemption of Zion, I think they wanted blood. I think they genuinely wanted blood. And that's why the Lord said, you know what, turn it around, right? Turn it around. And uh, because the harder of the thing for you to do right now is for you to mm. march back and, and bow. And I think that, um, I think it's going to be a little bit like that with the re redemption of Zion. That's going to take place. Now. I think people are going to expect this lamb and they're not going to want to march. They're not going to want to march on a pillar of fire and a cloud by day. That's obliterating men, women, and children in his path. And they're not going to want to do that. And I think that the first Zion's camp was much more willing to 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 do that. And so I think we, we need to realize, like you said, we need to be willing to do whatever the Lord requires. And typically what the Lord requires is what's more difficult for us because it's it's designed to teach us. Right. Mm. Yeah. Good point. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Really good. Nice. All right, I'll do my first insight here. Now, I started off this insight 
doing some comparisons of bits and pieces, and then I get all the way through, and I'm doing the, these comparisons of like Moroni and and um and you know and righteous versus unrighteous da 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 da, da and then I get down to a certain point, and then the manual lays it out for us anyway. So, um, this insight's a little long, and I probably will summarize some of it because it, I just ended up going, well, I've come this far, <laughs> and just like sort of. Um, finish it off with what some of the the manual said, but um, anyway, I'll just go through. I may I may summarize some of this, but so the the crux of this insight is like what was I started off basically with showing what some of the characteristics of the Nephites that made them successful in war, and um, kind of links to what Ammon's insight was. And uh, you can see my very first thing here is exactly what I just said about Ammon's point. It's their intentions, right? So I'm a forty three. And then the now the design of the Nephites was to support their lands and their houses and their wives and their children, that they might preserve them from the hands of their enemies. The righteous intention, and also that they might preserve the, their rights and their privileges, yea, and also their liberty. That they might worship God according to their desires. I think God is going to protect that uh, desire, don't you? Uh, for they knew if they should fall into the hands of the Lamanites that whosoever should worship God in spirit and in truth, the true and the living God, the Lamanites would destroy. So they've got a great reason to fight straight away. Uh, second thing I note, they prepared well. Uh, they had armor. And I kind of loved this part of the story. Um, and this is what's fun about reading the Book of Mormon sort of in order from start to finish, even though it's not really in, in order a lot, a lot of the time. Uh, Alma 43, and when the army, when the armies, when the armies of the Lamanites saw that the people of Nephi or that Moroni had prepared his people with breastplates and with arm shields, yea, and also shields to defend their heads, and also they were dressed with thick clothing. Now the army of Zarahemna was not prepared with any such thing. They had only their swords and their scimitars, their bows and their arrows, their stones and their slings, and they were naked. Save it were a skin which was girded about their loins, yea, they were all naked. Save it were the Zoramites and the Amalekites, because they wore a little bit of clothes because they were ex Nephites. But they were not armed with breastplates nor shields. Therefore, they were exceedingly afraid of the armies of the Nephites because of their armor, notwithstanding their number being so much greater than the Nephites. So this was like unheard of. This is the first time they've ever seen this, is that they had prepared so well. They came with armor and scared the heck out of them with their preparation. And there's lessons to learn here, you know, that we, we you know, um, again, firstly, what's our intent, intention in things that we do? And do we prepare? Um, the next thing point was they followed the prophet literally what i just said uh moroni literally asked alma where they should go uh what they should do and where, should, where they should go to defend their people and then he did as he was instructed uh which showed great faith in the prophet because the prophet wasn't there he he wrote to him he sent his guys to him and said what do we do um and he literally told him place you guys here place you guys here da 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 uh, the manual says, obeying the prophet brings blessings. Captain Moroni's desire to seek and follow the prophet's counsel led to many victories. Life's battles today will also be won by following the prophet. President Spencer W. Kimball emphasized why we need to follow the prophets. Let us hearken to those we sustain as prophets and seers, as well as the other brethren, as if our eternal life depended on it, because it does. I like that. Um... Alma 43, I think this is chapter 43 still. Uh, Nevertheless, the Nephites were inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for monarchy nor power. They were fighting for their homes and their liberties and their wives, their children, everything we pretty much said. Um, and they were doing that which they felt was their, the duty which they owed to their God. For the Lord had said unto them and also unto their fathers, inasmuch as ye are not guilty of the first offense, neither the second, ye shall not suffer yourselves to be slain by the hands of your enemies. So I love that. He gives them this... You know, you have a right to defend yourself. You know, you're not going to just let yourself be utterly destroyed. Um, you know, you, you guys didn't start the fight. You didn't start the second fight. Uh, but you won't don't allow yourself to be slain by the hands of your enemies. I, I just love that that the Lord's. You know, it's not a it's not a religion of weakness. It's not he's not a god of weakness. He's a god of strength and power, and he will preserve his people. And he gives us the right to defend ourselves. I like that. Uh, and again, the Lord has said that you shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. Therefore, for this cause, where the Nephites contending with the Lamanites to defend themselves and their families and their lands, their country, their rights, and the religion. Very important. Um, and I also feel like that's good to know because in the future, 
this may become something that is called upon us to do, to defend our families. Who knows? Um, there is a quote here from the manual. I'm just going to see if there's anything here I really need to read. Um, there's a quote from Gordon B. Hinckley in here. Um, and he goes on about exactly what I just said. I'll just read the last part. So Gordon B. Hickley says, we are a freedom-loving people committed to the defense of liberty wherever it is in jeopardy. I believe that God will not hold men and women in uniform responsible as agents of their government in carrying forward that which they are legally obligated to do. It may even be that he will hold us responsible if we try to impede or hedge up the way of those who are involved in a contest with forces of evil and repression. So it's pretty much what I said before. Um, he expects us to defend ourselves and our countries and our liberty and our and do our duty and actually not stand in the way um, of people trying to do that. So it's very interesting. Uh, another in, another point is they were merciful. So, you know, these, these righteous people, Moroni and his people, they were merciful. They gave their enemies multiple chances to surrender in multiple of the battles. They didn't just, it's kind of what Michael was just talking about. They didn't delight in the bloodshed. They went all about the killing. You know, it wasn't fun for them. And Moroni at multiple times would see them overtaking, like we, the, the the righteous were the ones winning and they would stop and say, look, you have this option to bail if you want. Uh, and of course they didn't most of the time. Um, and then even though it, uh, they, so they'd start killing again and then when it got really, really obvious that they were about to kill them, he'd give them another top option and they would probably take that and, and run at that point. So again, the intention, the difference is the intention. Well, the Lamanites wouldn't stop if it was a flipped scenario. Um, and hence again why the Lord was with them um, and it came, you know, so here's a scripture verse 20 it came to pass that Moroni caused that the work of death should cease among the people and he took their weapons of war from the Lamanites and after they'd entered into a covenant so he's not stupid he makes them enter into a covenant they won't come back um, they were suffered to depart into the wilderness and so anyway like I said I started going through all these sort of um, things about you know what made these righteous people successful in war or why was the Lord with them? And these were the reasons. And then just lastly here, the, the the manual has this really cool part where it shows the difference between Moroni and Amalekiah, for instance. And I'll just give a quick brief overview of this before I end. So, so Moroni, he sought for, obtained and heeded the word of the Lord given through the living prophet. That was something that Moroni did. And Amalekiah obtained all his power by fraud and deceit and didn't care what, what God thought. Um, Moroni was vitally concerned for the welfare of those who served under his command. Amalekiah did not care for the blood of his people. He would throw people at the walls until he got what he wanted. Moroni used strategy, as Ammon said, to overcome his enemies. And Amalekiah incited the people through hatred and propaganda. Um, and again, didn't care about the blood of his, his people. Moroni was firm for the right, yet quick, quick to forgive. Um, and I don't have an Amalekiah for that one. Uh, Moroni was a patriotic in spirit and prayerful in attitude, and Amalekiah was governed by selfish passion and tried to aggressively conquer and make oaths to destroy. And Moroni was a noble man, of, um, a noble man, a man of God. Amalekiah cursed God and swore to kill. Very vast difference between these two people and their their parties, their groups, their their armies. Um, and just this this one scripture, which is awesome, everyone knows it. Alma 48, verse 17, Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, if all men had been and were and ever would be like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. Yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. So this is a guy that we can strive to be like, you know, and if we are always striving to be like someone like Moroni, um, our intentions will be will be right. Um, we'll be on the right side. We will be prepared, you know, like, like he was with armor and things, um, you know, he loved his people. He didn't want them to suffer and die, you know, so um, he, he follows the prophet. He, he does what's right. His intentions are always good and and righteous. Um, and so I guess all this comes down to is that he is a man that we should strive to emulate. And if we do so, the Lord will basically always have our backs in whatever we're trying to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dog. You actually, one of the one of the quotes here that you use here for Moroni is one of my favorites, and and I always call it I call it the uh, when you run out of cheeks, uh, Moroni scripture, and because uh, what he's teaching there is when you run out of cheeks, you're not guilty of the first offense. What is that? You've been smitten on the cheek, and what does the Lord tell you to do? 
turn the other cheek. And then he says, now I've done run out of cheeks. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. And so it's the I've you've just you've just caused me to run out of cheeks, and now uh, now I'm going to end this. And so I I I love that scripture. I you know people people I think have this uh, mindset that like we 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 are to forgive people right seventy times seven right until we're perfected, and uh, you know and even after that. But um, the the concept is is that we we aren't supposed to be taken for a fool. Right. We aren't supposed to be uh, destroyed. Right. So I love that. Um, The other thing that you were talking about there is uh, once again, is the glory in blood. And I don't think I think that people don't understand how especially men, I would say we're more prone to this one, um, how much we are actually prone to enjoy this. I don't think that the natural man, I I think we are far less likely to admit how easy it is the glory and blood and here's just one example i can give you multiple prophets of god that have talked about hunting uh and fishing but pr- primarily hunting where people glory in the hunt and and uh and where they say if you enjoy hunting the process of stalking finding an animal and killing it you are glorying in the blood now you can hunt and you can kill and you can do that, but it's to feed yourself. You're not glorying in the actual killing of the animal and that uh, the the blood of every animal be required. And I will tell you, having been a fisherman, ha- you know, being involved in hunting stuff, there is a an adrenaline. There is a there is something in the blood that. I think it's a lot. I think I said, I think people are a little less likely to admit how easy it is for people to be drawn to glory and blood and and how fun it is and how easy it is for men to, to, to fall into that. So how hard or how much we should, how rare it is that there are men like Moroni and men that were like, um, Washington, you know, men that, um, that, can sheathe their swords and and can keep it in right i think that bloodlust is actually a, a real thing that we just kind of overlook and the last thing that i would say i, I love here is that you went over the um the captain moroni scripture scripture of any man could be him and it, it's not it, and i just want to say it's not easy to be moroni's it's not easy right and i think that um i think that it's one of those terms that gets thrown around maybe a little bit too often right um if if, if it was easy to be him the the gates of hell will be shaken forever and we aren't ex- we aren't experiencing that so th- these type of people are rare and and you listed off some characteristics of him he was a selfless man at great personal cost it's his his wealth his uh what he gained from this um was never mentioned by anybody um uh he, he never and i'll tell you what being a general if you're living above your means, you you lose the respect of all your men, right? Um, very quickly. That's it. It's gone. Um, he he was a man that was selfish. He did things at great personal cost, and he followed the keys. He was humble enough to follow the keys. These things are not easy to do, brothers and sisters. They aren't easy to do. And I know I'd, I, I I we we don't like tooting our own horns, but let me just for a moment toot Ammon and Topher's horns. Because I think that to a degree, I've just described men like Ammon and Topher. They're selfless. They 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 haven't gotten gain from anything that they've done in this, right? And uh, and once again, followed the keys at great personal cost and stood up for it when they didn't want to do it, right? And 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 so maybe the people that were glorifying, look at them. Did they follow the keys at great personal cost, or did they teach that it's okay to follow your spiritual meter? What did they do? Right. What are these heroes of you doing? What are these Joan of Arcs doing? Did they follow the keys or did they cut and run? What did they do? And what about great personal cost? Did they sacrifice time hours out of their life week after week after week for years to do something like come follow me just to try to help people, just try to bless people? Or did they try to do come follow me for a couple months trying to make a buck out of it and then say, this is too much work and I'm not making enough money and cut and run. Right. I, so once again, I think that we, we, we need to realize how rare this is. And I think that 
people are glorifying the wrong Joan of Arcs. What, what you're what you're glorifying is a Joan of Arc. You're not glorifying a Moroni. You're not glorifying a Moroni. Moronis are selfless men, great personal cost, sacrifice, and they follow the keys. And uh, I think that I think that I think maybe people overlook just that they we've been, they've been doing this. Ammon Tover been doing this since the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, there's stuff that I think that, you know, maybe they've had to sacrifice in order to make something like this happen. Right. I think that Moroni maybe would have enjoyed a, a fishing trip or two. You know, I think he would have enjoyed some of that. Instead, he was off patrolling the lands, trying to keep his people safe. You know, uh, he could have been a uh, he could have been going to Lagoon, but they, <laughs> Moroni was off fighting the battle, you know. And so I think that uh, we need to we need to um, glorify the right kind of heroes. And these are the right characteristics, right? These are the characteristics we should look for. Well, thanks, Micah. <laughs> all, all those nice things flipped in reverse would be more appropriately stated about you, I think. But it's nice of you to say that. Um. Two little side notes, I think, to this. One would be, I think that you've taught the concept of intention the correct way. Because people these days, when we talk about intention, members of our church, they use the concept of intention to justify doing nothing or justify doing the wrong thing by pretending like their intention was good, but it, but it just didn't get to be shown as good or something similar. And... My question is, was Captain Moroni's intentions ever a question? Did somebody, somebody need to see inside of Captain Moroni's heart to know what he was intending on doing? Or was he literally rending his own clothing and writing it and hanging it up from every street corner in the entire town? There was nothing about what Captain Moroni did as far as his intentions were concerned that was ambiguous, right? No one could say, oh, well, you don't really know what's going on in Captain Moroni's heart. Maybe he's just a bloodthirsty man. He did it for liberty, freedom, and religion. End of. It was out there and open. And if anyone wants to join, you join. And if you don't want to join, we're going to conquer because you're going to destroy us. So, you know, I think you taught intention really well because the Lord with those that have pure intentions and pure intentions are manifested by one's actions, right? Always manifested by their actions. Otherwise they're not intentions. Everything that flows from the heart comes out the mouth. Everything that flows from the heart comes out in the actions. So if they were true intent, truly intending to do righteousness, they were performing righteousness. And in those circumstances, the Lord justifies those people. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just, a great example of what real intention, real righteous intention is versus what so many in our church are falling into with this concept that I'm allowed to do the wrong thing and pretend that my intentions were pure and you're not allowed to say anything to me because you don't know what's inside here and therefore you can't judge. That's incorrect. Okay, so that was cool. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention because you brought up Malachi and maybe we'll continue to talk about him, but even... This is so interesting. Even a Malachiah refused to accept the oath that he would not come against the Nephites in the future. He would rather die, like, like he was going to risk his men's life and his own life to die just at making the oath that he wouldn't do it. He could have just said to him, okay, fine, we give up, we won't come against you. And then two weeks later, he could have raised a, a bigger army and then gone and done it. But even a bloodthirsty maniac who's willing to murder people and kill people over, you know, pathetic reasons or whatever, a completely wicked man, even he was loath to, to break an oath. So if some kind of like bloodthirsty, murderous maniac sees the value in making and keeping oaths, maybe we need to be careful about it. That's all. Yeah. You know, I, I was point. just I was just thinking that that is such a good point because what when saints do that, it's it be it's saints misunderstanding that motive part. The you don't know my heart. It would be like if Moroni butchered 
the people in the river and didn't even give them a chance to take the oath and then turning around and saying, you don't know my heart. Yeah. What do you I know. I, I dude, I just watched you butcher them. What do you mean I don't know your heart? <laughs> like, what are you talking your about? Your, your heart, heart is running red through the river as they speak. <laughs> yes. Yes. What do you mean I don't know your heart? Like they dead, bro. Like, and you didn't even give them a chance to to surrender, right? It's like your motives be damned, bro. Like they're decapitated in the river, you know, like it, it, it's like that. You know, it's like we don't have to ask what Moroni's motives were. We saw it like we know what was in his heart based off of what he did. You're you're n not willing to do any of these things unless you get gain. We don't have to ask, right? The, the blood's in the river, right? It's a, that's a, that's such a great point because that's what they would do. They'd be like, "You don't know Moroni's heart." It's like, what the heck? What are you talking about? You know, it's that's yeah, that's psycho. I'm I'm gonna make that a mem. Moroni standing in a bloody river. Just says you don't know my heart underneath it, like that's 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 exactly that's exactly right. That's good point. Mm. Okay, I only have one point today, but it's like really long, and I seem to do this a lot. I get stuck on these points, and it's like I can't cut out scriptures because like you have to hear these things in context. Or else, because anybody can take a scripture out of context, 2 Nephi 2.25, and then just run with it. And it's like, you need to hear what's happening in context, or you just don't understand what's happening. And this is one of those things, right? And I'm and I reading in this week's Come Follow Me reading, I, it was one of those ones that I didn't feel like, once again, was even covered. It just kind of, they just kind of glossed over it. And so um, I was reading... Uh, the this week's come follow me weekly weekly readings and uh, early on, like especially early on in the readings, it was focused on trying to answer the question why there's so much focus on the war chapters in the Book of Mormon. Like why there what will be the reason that there's so many of these chapters? Like what like why are they included in here? Like a lot of focus on that. And I feel like a lot of the answers were heartfelt. I felt like they 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 were they weren't necessarily malicious. Right. I, I think they were heartfelt but they were skipping around the answer. Like they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to commit to anything, right? Like a priest crafter, right? They wanted to read everything and be like, yeah, make up your own mind. Um, I'm not going to say anything. Um, once again, I feel like the reason for that is because we don't want to hear the answer. Like we know the answer, but the answer is so ugly and it makes us evaluate something that we don't want to evaluate. So we just ignore it, right? Um, one such student manual section, I believe provides a perfect example of what I'm describing. And then I'm going to go into it. It, it was Alma 43 background to the wars. And, and it was, this is in purple and it does some numbers here. It says one, the Zormites descended from the Nephites. So this is, once again, this is the background for the war period. So this is what brought about this crazy war period. Okay. This is the, the, the church of student manuals explanation. Then it says two, the Nephites feared the dissenters would join with the Lamanites Alma endeavored to preach the word of God to the Zormites to keep this from happening, right? So they, they preached to try to prevent this, and then they even tried to kill people to try to prevent this. The Zormites who believed in Alma's preachings were cast out by unbelieving Zormites who feared the loss of their wealth and power if conversion were widespread. For the people of Ammon, also known as the anti-Nephi Lehi's, provided for the welfare of the cast out Zormites. Once again, there's a mention of physical, temporal um, a oneness. The apostate Zormites threatened the people of Ammon, but the people of Ammon continued to help the rejected Zormites. So there is now threatening that is going on here and infighting. And, and uh, I stopped there in the student manual. Now it says here that the Zormites feared the loss of their wealth and power if conversion were widespread. And that's all it said. Now, that seems like it might contain some vital information that they left out of that summary that might explain what started all the war chapters. So let's go to those scriptures for one second. In Alma 35, we read, and it came to pass that after the more popular part of the Zoramites, so once again, popularity, right? These This was the priestcraft cabal, 
right? They had the most subscribers and um, right, be, be sure to subscribe, like, and share had consulted together concerning the words which had been preached unto them. They were angry because of the word for it did destroy their craft. Therefore, they would not hearken unto the words and they sent and gathered together throughout all the land of the people and consulted with them concerning the words which had been spoken, you know, sending emails to people. Hey, are that, is that Zion group still meeting together? Like, hey, like, what are your thoughts on the this this teaching about priestcraft? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Right now, the rulers and their priests and their teachers. That sounds a lot, a lot like church callings, doesn't it? did not let the people know concerning their desires, which was what? To keep their craft. Therefore, they found out privately the minds of all the people. And it came to pass after they had found out the minds of all the people, those that were in favor of the words which had been spoken by Alma and his brethren were cast out of the land. They were excommunicated. They were kicked out of Ezra's eagle group, right? You're out. And they were many, and they came over under the land of Jershon. Okay, Brigham Young taught... When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached on the earth and the kingdom of God is established, there's also a spirit in these things and the, an almighty spirit too. When these two spirits come in contact one with the other, the spirit of the gospel reflects light upon the spirit which God has placed in man and wakes him up to a consciousness of his true state, which makes him afraid he will be condemned for he perceives at once that Mormonism is true. Our craft is in danger is the first thought that strikes the wicked and dishonest of mankind. When the light of truth shines upon them, say they, if these people called Latter-day Saints are correct in their views, the whole world must be wrong. Really? The whole world is wrong? But I've seen, you know, X, Y, and Z do it. It can't be wrong, right? The whole world's doing it. And what will become of our time Arnold institutions? and of our influence, which we have swayed successfully over the minds of the people for ages. This Mormonism must be put down. So priestcraft presented a bold and extended front against the truth, and with this we have to contend, this is our deadliest foe, end quote, Brigham Young. In there, in there, our craft is in danger. Brigham Young quotes Acts 19. So let's turn to Acts chapter 19, if we forgot what that was. And the same time, there arose no small stir about the way for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana. So he had an Etsy shop and he sold, you know, uh, let God prevail merchandise, brought no small gain under the craftsmen. Well, this person did pretty well in this Etsy project whom he called together with the woke with the worksmen of like occupation oh so he's formed a priestcraft cabal and said sirs you know that by this craft we have our wealth this is how we make our money we can't spread the kingdom of god if we if we lose this money moreover ye see and hear that not only at ephesus but amongst throughout all asia this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. You know, you're going around preaching that uh, this idolatry and stuff isn't good and that we shouldn't listen to it, right? This isn't, and this isn't right. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be said at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificent, magnificent magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. You're not just, just try, gonna, trying to destroy priestcraft. You're also destroying these individuals. Let's name them blankety blank and blank and blank. And the whole world admires them. The young women of the church love her, right? You're going to destroy her. You can't do that. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Emily Bell. I mean, great is Diana of Ephesians. Great is Diana of Ephesians. The war chapters, this is my words, the war chapters in the Book of Mormon were entirely brought about by priestcraft, entirely brought about by priestcraft, which we just proved. And the war that followed is a type for the war between the true saints of God and the priestcraft within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Remember, these people were ex-members. These were apostates from the truth. Okay, These are those that were practicing priestcraft. Alma chapter 1. 
And Alma said unto him, Behold, this is the first time that priestcraft has been introduced among this people. And behold, thou art not only guilty of priestcraft, but priestcraft, but have endeavored to enforce it by the sword. And were priestcraft to be enforced among this people, it would prove their entire destruction. But it came to pass that whosoever did not belong to the church of God began to persecute those that did belong to the church of God and had taken upon them the name of Christ. Yea, they did persecute them and afflict them with all manner of words, and this because of their humility. So this is what's the starting of this boiling point in war. And what was the reason for this? What was the conflict? Because they were not proud in their own eyes, and because they did impart the word of God one with another without money and without price. Now, this was in the second year of the reign of Alma, and it was the cause of much affliction in the church. Yea, it was the cause of much trial with the church. For the hearts of many were hardened, and their names were blotted out, that they were remembered no more among the people of God. And also many withdrew themselves from among them. Now, this was a great trial to those that did stand fast in the faith. Nevertheless, they were steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of God, and they bore with patience the persecutions that was heaped upon them. And when the priests left their labor to impart the word of God on the people, the people also left their labors to hear the word of God. And when the priest had imparted unto them the word of God, they all returned again diligently unto their labors. And the priest, not esteeming himself above his hearers, for the preacher was no better than the hearer, neither was the teacher any better than the learner, and thus they were all equal, and they did all labor, every man according to his strength, and they did impart of their substance, every man according to that which he had, to the poor and the needy and the sick and the afflicted, and they did not wear costly apparel, yet they were neat and comely. Moroni chapter 8, Behold, I speak unto you as if you're present, yet ye are not, but behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know you're doing. And I know that you do walk in the pride of your hearts, and there are none save a few only who do not lift themselves up in the pride of their hearts, unto the wearing of very fine apparel. Hopefully you're seeing how all these are directly connected. On envying and strives and malice and persecutions and all manner of iniquity. And your churches, yea, even every one, have become polluted because of the pride of your hearts. For behold, you do love money and your substance and your fine apparel and the adorning of your churches more than you love the poor and the needy and the sick and the afflicted. Oh, you pollutions, you hypocrites, you teachers who sell yourselves for that which will canker. Why have you polluted the Holy Church of God? Why are you ashamed to take upon you the name of Christ? Remember what happened to the people in Alma chapter one? They had taken upon themselves the name of Christ and imparted the word of God without money and without price, right? Taking upon your na the name of Christ was tied directly to that. And now he's saying you sold yourself for that which is cankered. And he's asking, why are you ashamed to take upon you the name of Christ? Why do you not think the greatest value of an endless happiness and the misery which never dies because of the praise of the world? Why do you adorn yourself with that which has no life and yet suffer the hungry and the needy and the naked and the sick and the afflicted to pass you by and notice them not? Okay, now let's go directly to the war chapters and let's not see. Can you not hear how this is all the same battle? Alma chapter 60, this is a letter that Moroni is writing. And now, my beloved brethren, for you ought to be beloved. Yea, you ought to have stirred yourself more diligently for the welfare and the freedom of this people. But behold, you have neglected them. Inasmuch as the blood of thousands shall come upon your heads for vengeance, yea, for known unto God were all their cries and all their sufferings. They wanted the books. They wanted to learn about this stuff, but you hid it all behind paywalls. Behold, could you suppose that you could sit upon your thrones? Luxury? And because of the exceeding goodness of God, right? Grace and mercy and love that you could do nothing and he would deliver you? Behold, if you suppose this, you have supposed in vain. Do you suppose that because so many of your brethren have been killed, spiritually murdered, gone inactive, it's because of their wickedness, I say unto you? If you suppose this, you suppose in vain. For I say unto you, there are many who have fallen by the sword, and behold, it is to your condemnation. For the Lord suffereth the righteous to be slain, that his justice and judgment may come upon the wicked. Therefore, you need not suppose that the righteous are lost because they are slain, but, but behold, they do enter into the rest of their Lord, their God. And now, behold, I say unto you, I fear exceedingly that the judgments of God will come upon this people because of their exceeding slothfulness. And what does it talk about in Doctrine Romans 101? Prevalent no moment is obituary, that they became slothful and hearkened not unto the commandments of God and didn't build the tower. Yea, even the slothfulness of our government and their exceeding great neglect towards their brethren, yea, towards those who have been slain. For were it not for the wickedness which first commenced at our head, we could have withstood our enemies that they could have gained no power over us. 
Yeah, had it not been for the war which broke out among ourselves. And what was that war that woke, broke out among ourselves over? Yeah, were it not for these kingsmen who caused so much bloodshed among ourselves. Yeah, at the time we were contending among ourselves. If we had united the strength as we hitherto have done, yea, had it not been for the desire of for power and authority which those king men had over us. Have you forgotten the commandments of the Lord your God? Have you forgotten the captivity of your fathers? Have you forgotten the many times we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies? Or do you suppose the Lord will still deliver us while we sit upon our thrones and do not make use of the means which the Lord has provided for us? Yea, will you sit in idleness while you are surrounded with thousands of those? Yea, and tens of thousands who do also sit in idleness? Well, there are thousands round about in the borders of the land who are falling by the sword, yea, wounded and bleeding. Do you suppose that God will look upon you as guiltless while you sit and behold these things and try to get gain from it? The only saying you, nay. Now I would that you should remember that God has said that the inward vessel shall be cleansed first and then shall the outer vessel be cleansed also. And now except you do not repent of that which you have done and begin to begin to be up and doing and send forth food and men unto us and also unto Helaman that he may support those parts of our country which he has regained and that we may also recover the remainder of our possessions in these parts behold it will be expedient that we contend no more with the Lamanites until we first cleansed our inner vessel end quote from Ronai's epistle there the inner vessel became polluted it began to only produce wild fruit it failed to build the tower, etc., and it became expedient to cleanse the inner vessel before anything else could be done. Moroni also warned that the head was also corrupt, right? He was worried that the head was also corrupt, but it came to, we came to find out later that the head was, in fact, not corrupt, but had lost all control over those under him. They were no longer listening to the prophet. For every man walketh after his own God. Doctrine and Covenants chapter 112. Verily, verily, I say unto you, darkness covereth the earth and gross darkness the minds of the people and all flesh has become corrupt before my face or polluted. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and lamentation. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord, and upon my house shall it begin. And from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Therefore, see to it that you trouble not yourselves concerning the affairs of my church. End quote from Doctrine and Covenants. The war chapters in the Book of Mormon center around priestcraft and end with the cleansing of the land first starting in the center the war chapters in the book of mormon center around the time period that the olive trees began to produce wild fruit in jacob chapter five it's the war chapter center around the time period in which the servants of the noblemen began to be slothful and not build the tower they began to sit upon their thrones in luxury and well Death was being administered everywhere for him. Might not this money better be spent, etc. The war chapters are some of the most important chapters in the Book of Mormon. And once again, they center around the battle against priestcraft and the self-justification and the popularity of it. But the overwhelming majority of they in the past, like the overwhelming majority of us today, just don't want to see it. They just don't want to hear it. And they definitely don't want to talk about it. Mole freedom, the Constitution, is about as far as our idolatry-ridden brains can compute. Well, that was the best ever. <laughs> you know, it's been so awesome going through the Book of Mormon together. And um, Mike, in particular, getting your explanation and and understanding on the priestcraft cycle throughout, and referencing being able to look at the scriptures that we're going through and going, hey, this, do you see how this connects to the generation that just came before it, or can you see how they're talking about 
for example, what you're sharing here, they're talking about the events that happened in the past that led them to the point where they're stuck now in this, in the ravages of warfare. And it all happened because of the, of the neglect to stop the priestcraft in the land. And because of that, it run rampant. That, that uh, wicked cabal of priestcrafters grew and then to the point where they had to contend with them and, you know, there were, many people were losing their lives. So I'm just extremely grateful for that because I think your mind works in a, in a very, in a, in a way that's really sequential and can piece those things together to really give a, a much more broad visual picture. And I'm a visual person. So by bringing together multiple sources, which your mind does very, very well, sort of multitask multiple sources and putting it together in a way that I can visualize it really, really helps me learn and understand. So I'm really, really grateful for that. And it's becoming extremely apparent to me the cycle of priestcraft throughout the Book of Mormon that absolutely led to these circumstances where Captain Moroni is just stuck now being a righteous man. Instead of going around sharing the gospel and living in peace and harmony with righteous saints, he's tearing his clothes off and getting people to make oaths to try and fix the problem that should never have been allowed to happen in the first place, you know? And boy, those people, those righteous people should have been grateful for the Captain Moronos of their day and the Captain Moronos of our day will be ones, perhaps like us, whose opinions are traditional and not, not enjoyed by the rest, rest of society, and also becoming increasingly unpopular among members of the church who are slowly but surely adapting and accepting priestcraft in their own lives. Um Great example as well from Acts 19, <laughs> the silversmith. He's like, oh, sure. I mean, this this is great stuff, but if I'm to accept it, what's going to happen to my craft? I'm not going to be able to sell my little silver trinkets anymore. And it's very, very, very true. When people come in contact with the gospel and they truly realize what it's going to take to be to become a true follower of Jesus Christ, they have to make the decision between the world and Jesus Christ. And it's going to be far harder for those that are in a position where they've built their livelihood on, on means that are inconsistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Much, much, much harder. But people can do it. And there's been some great examples of people giving up priestcraft, people giving up the concept of energy healing and stuff like that within the Zionobus group that we've seen which is incredibly impressive. There's been examples where people have had one understanding on something and when they've come into this group and come to understand the doctrine correctly, they've done a full 180 and completely turned away from it. That to me is just very, very impressive. People that are willing to, as they're learning line upon line and their understanding is growing and becoming brighter, ch completely change on a dime to follow what is real and follow what is right. And I hope I hope we can all be like that. I'm definitely, that's definitely the path that I'm taking with my understanding of priestcraft. You know, the more I understand priestcraft, the more that I'm wanting to align myself with the doctrine and avoid it. Yes, man. So the war chapters, I think I mentioned a little bit of this in my next insight, but the war chapters are something that are so they contain actually so much goodness but it's so easily overlooked i think by so many saints right like it's so easy i mean you guys would have heard it i've heard it my whole life like i skipped the war chapters you know what the heck are they even in there for you know <laughs> like who wants you know i can't believe there's so much killing and murder in the book of mormon and da 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 da, da. and uh yeah sure skip them and uh you're part of the problem uh, you, you've you've not gained a single ounce of what what they're there for, because there's literally so much practical. And this is like, and what Mike is, and Mike has this like what Emma just said. Mike has this insane, insanely amazing way of like just hitting angles on things that I wouldn't even see. So I love Mike's insights every time because I just I wouldn't have even. I'm so I feel like I'm so like 
myopic almost so stuck in like my this is this is the inside for the week and this is what it's talking about that mike is outside the box man he's piecing stuff together from all over the place and it's it's awesome um but people aren't going to get any of this you know they they you know there's there's practical goodness in the war chapters and there's spiritual goodness in there as well and as micah has just pointed out here there's uh also legitimate real world application uh and and uh types and shadows of things that will and are happening in our day and <clears throat> again i would not be able to put that together like i just don't have firstly the time but the brain like like mike is just next level with this this stuff and it's really appreciated honestly um so anyway the war chapters contain some some uh amazingly important stuff and um uh again I've, I've talked about intention so much. I'm a broken record, but again, a lot of this is again about intention um, of of the people. Again, what's the intention of us? Uh, vanity and pride, and desiring gain as a reward for teaching and doing things that we want to do. We want reward. You know, we want gain. We want something. We want you know the Zoramites. You know, like we we can't have our craft destroyed. We can't have our money taken. Like this this is how we. You know, and they're they 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 fear that as as uh, Alma is going around and teaching the people, um, if too many of us get converted, you know, where I'm not going to have nice things anymore. You know, the absolute one of the main crux reasons of the issue with priestcraft is that once you gain money from teaching these things, everything becomes about a way of keeping that thing, even if it's at the detriment of yourself and everyone around you. Um. And uh, so, yeah, again, do we have this vanity and pride and the desire to continue to gain reward for teaching? Maybe we've, you know, are we out, are we out there slinging whatever doctrine we can to gain subscribers? Are we making video after video after video, literally posting multiple videos a day, writing book after book of things, just hoping to make a buck? Um, or are we not even concerned about the money? Are we neat and comely? Uh, and we desire for all to have, to be on the even playing field, to have the truth, regardless of who you are, how much money you've got, you know, what the state of your life is, um, come, it's free. It's without money and without cost and everyone deserves the same. Um, and so, so many are out for themselves right now, honestly. Um, like I said, trying to make video after video, trying to gain subscribers. It's, it's just so rampant and so common. Um, and as Micah pointed out here, what, I mean, what happens to those who these people are blaspheming against the Lord in his own house? You know, and what happens to these people? Uh, they are destroyed first, and and the Lord is going to cleanse his his temple. He's he's going to cleanse. His, it starts in his own church. It starts in his own house. And um, if if we're not careful uh, about what we're trying to do, we are at risk of this cleansing because the cleansing is coming, regardless. And everyone's craft is in danger. And so, I guess it's, that's a good question. Is like, what's your craft? You know, is it priest? Is it priesty priestcraft, or is it uh, you know free and um, for all? You know, just not not a, not a craft at all, I guess. But what, what's your craft really? That's a that's an important thing to consider. Um, and I guess the last point is that we can continue to make a difference, a positive impact, and a positive difference on people by talking about these things. By Micah continually pointing out these uh, amazing, awesome sort of putting this together, which again I would not have even thought of this but talking about this stuff pointing it out because as we've talked about in in like zion or bus for instance how many people have actually been able to turn to learn and to humble themselves and turn their lives around and get rid of some of this stuff that's not not great to be involved with and actually get on the right track it's possible and it happens and so we have this ability to actually make a difference um talking about truth sharing truth and pointing out the hypocrisy and the wickedness and the selfishness and all the issues that come with priestcraft. And so it's important that we keep doing that. But yeah, again, fantastic point. And I really appreciate that uh, we have Micah, honestly, to put, to put stuff like this together, which I would not be able to do. Very good. Moving on down. Shaking on Moving up. on down. Numero Tuno. This is just a brief one. From, from the Come Follow Me manual, it says, Satan tempts and deceives us little by little. What would have happened if Amalekiah had told Lehontai 
what he planned to do from the beginning. What do these verses teach us about how Satan tries to deceive us? Now, isn't that the real danger with everything? Slow and steady deception until you're convinced of a lie? It's not like there's... It's not like Satan says, Ammon, I want you to be an alcoholic. I want to steal your soul. It's like, hey, hey, Ammon, come hang out with your friends. Oh, they're, they're drinking. You don't have to drink. But if you want to, you can, you know, come and do this. Come and do that. Oh, you're a silversmith. If that person wants you to make them a shrine, you can charge them money. That's your craft, you know, or. You spent a lot of time on that book about Jesus, Ammon. You deserve some compensation. No, just a little. Get that new thing that you've wanted. Whatever it is, you spent a lot. Of, it's good. It's a good thing to spend time on Jesus. Uh, so that's that's always the the little lie we tell ourselves, right? Like Satan's not trying to go. I'm going to turn you into a priest crafter, Ammon. He's just going to be like, yeah, serve it. Treat yourself. You know, it's slow and steady. He puts on those, what does the Book of Mormon call them? He puts on those cords, flaxen cords, until eventually it becomes chains, and then you're bound, and then he's got you. Anyway, while I was thinking about this, the way that Satan tries to deceive us, my immediate thought, my immediate reaction, the immediate example that popped into my mind was the Chosen. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad comedy. Or I'm not saying it's a bad <laughs> drama. I'm not saying it's a bad series. It's probably great fun to watch. But my concern is that when we watch things like The Chosen and we unite ourselves with other Christians behind its portrayal of Christ, that can become a problem. Whilst unity with others might seem like a positive thing, is the end result positive if you have watered down and changed the divinity and attributes of Christ to become something that he was not? To me, that's the flaxen cords until eventually you're so converted by the chosen that you believe in an entirely different Jesus Christ to the rest of us. You believe in the mainstream Christianity version of Jesus Christ, or you've, you believe in a Jesus Christ that is so generic that everybody would everybody outside the true doctrine of Jesus Christ containing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints may agree with you. And if that was the case, then what's the point of being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Why not be a Catholic? Why not be a Protestant? Why not be a born-again, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, whatever you want to call them? If you believe the same doctrine as them, why not be them? And is that not really the drama here? And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, here's a couple of things. Five things that Jesus did not say. Number one, follow your heart. You know, the chosen Jesus, follow your heart. Jesus actually said, follow me. Number two, be true to yourself. Now, I'm not sure. I will back up and say, I'm not sure if the Jesus in the chosen literally said these things or not. But it, my, the point that I'm making is the portrayal of Jesus watered down attributes and changing attributes from what is contained in holy writ in scripture just like these inaccurate portrayals of jesus christ that i'm listing is poisonous let me continue number two be true to yourself no sorry yeah number two be true to yourself but jesus actually said whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself number three believe in yourself doesn't the world tell you that Believe in you. Have faith in you. You're, you can do it. Jesus actually said, believe in me. Number four, live your truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Number five, as long as you are happy. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? That's it. Nice. Um, yeah, this is nice and simple. Uh, I think I've probably used this analogy before, but if if the Lord shocked us with lightning, right, every time we did something silly, we wouldn't do the silly thing, right? So we know that that doesn't happen, right? The Lord doesn't doesn't shock us when we make silly decisions, when we do silly things. Um, when I'm lazy, I don't get shocked. There's almost actually no consequence, right? 
uh, I can forego doing something that I am meant to do, unless it's something my my wife has asked me to do, <laughs> there will be a consequence, right? But if there's something that I know I need to do, uh, and there's no one that's asked me, but I know I need to do something, maybe or uh, and I and I and I neglect to do it, or I make a conscious decision to do something that I know I shouldn't have done, uh, I don't get a uh, consequence. There's actually nothing that will happen to me, and what will happen is. The next time I go to do that thing, uh, you don't even almost consider it. You just do it because you've done it before and there was no lightning the previous time. Um, and, and so there's no there's no repercussions. And uh, this is this is Satan tempting us little by little, right? Like it, it becomes easy because little by little, every time you do something, it becomes easy to do it again. You glide into it because it's, you know, there's there's been no repercussion for it um, before. And this is, this is how Satan gets us. Um, so we've got to be really careful of that, honestly, um, because really, really easy to slip into that. Um, and to your point about the Chosen, for instance, um, now I've never watched the Chosen. I think I started watching like one episode way back in the day. I never even finished it. I don't think. Um, but here, here's a question to consider: Where do you learn about Jesus? Right? TV shows. Or scriptures. Where's the factual record about Jesus, right? It's only scripture. That's it. It's now here's a really important thing to consider. It's really, really easy to remember and to recall things you've watched in video. Like, like, I don't know about you guys, like it, it's I find it very hard to remember scripture unless I've, you know, memorized scriptural verses or whatever. I used to have the scripture masteries and stuff, but even those I've forgotten now. But it's very hard to remember. When, especially when we're covering scriptures each week, very, very hard to remember scripture. But if I watch a video, there'll be things from that video that I will remember essentially forever. You know, they're in your head forever, like these videos, the video portrayal of a thing. So where do you learn about Jesus? Is it from a TV show, from a movie, or from the actual source of what he did and said, right? Which is scripture. That's it. That's all we have. Um, and you could, I guess, to an extent, extent say um, Doctrine and Covenants, Latter-day Revelation as well. Um, so here's my point. It's really, really easy sometimes to remember the video of something. Now, what if that video is actually incorrect about what he said and what he did in your head? Now, it's really, really easy to remember the incorrect version of what Jesus said and did, um, just because your, your brain can remember the video version of it. And, you know, you've heard of the Mandela effect. We've all had these things happen in our lives where we could swear we remember certain things and um it turns out we've we've there's a but there's a bunch of the weird ones but we've remembered them incorrectly but we remember certain things and it's hazy it's in our head and it's incorrect and here's this isn't a mandela effect but here's an example of what i'm talking about everyone remembers star wars the empire strikes back i believe it is and um when darth vader is when luke fights darth vader and he cuts his hand off and Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father. That's what people think. That's the common line. Everyone always says, Luke, I am your father. It'll be on a shirt. It'll be on everything, right? That's not even the line. He actually says, no, I am your father. That's the line, right? But everyone will remember and think that it's Luke, I am your father, right? Who knows why that is? It was probably said somewhere originally whatever, but the fact of the matter is my point is that that's actually wrong. It's not true. So, if you've watched a video, and particularly one that wasn't made by the church, and it's made uh, and it's about Jesus, but he says things that aren't scriptural, you now have in your head forevermore the video version of an incorrect statement made by Jesus rather than something that was true made by Jesus. And you will remember that over any scripture that you will read. I guarantee it. And that that's true. It's a true thing. It's, at least for me, it is. And I'd be very hesitant if I'd be... I'd, be surprised if it didn't affect everyone the same way. So very, very, uh, very important point Ammon makes. And um, anyway, that's that's my thought on it. And I think that's um, something like seriously we need to be uh, wary of. Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, that's true. And sometimes memory is a is a funny thing. I was convinced that Topher shared a story about a pen just a, a little bit ago that. Uh, Totally didn't happen. Apparently, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It didn't happen. I, I don't. I am 
I am convinced that it was Topher. Nah, nope, that never happened. I I I went into an alternate universe accidentally somehow, but uh, that didn't happen. You know, th this list is so good, and it 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 could genuinely never end like you could do more and more because this is just simply this is just simply what people were are saying that isn't true so like jesus never said follow your heart jesus said follow me right jesus said your heart is this jesus never said this but you could also do this one where people will will quote something that's accurate such as well god's love god's love micah god's love but but what 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 are they saying when they say that they're saying all God is, is love. That's what they're saying. God never said that. God said he is love, but he didn't say that's all I am. He didn't say, oh, that's all I am. I'm just a big ball of love. I got no intelligence. I got no justice. All I got is love, right? And so what people will do is they'll take that line, I am love, and they'll just say, that's all God is. That's all you need to know about him, right? So this list, that list could genuinely, it could go forever. Um, this story uh, about uh, um, good old uh, Abalakai and Lahotai, man, that's a good one. That's one of the ones having the sharpening sword, the 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 poisoning by degrees. What uh, it, he is one of the once again going back to the war chapters being central for pre priestcraft. Um, he is. What what is one of the main things that fuels the priestcraft cabal? What is it? Just have we it's nothing wrong with having a conversation. We're just just having a conversation. Let's just talk. There's nothing wrong with having a conversation. Bro, bro, if he never left the hill to have that stupid conversation, he wouldn't be dead. If he had just stayed on the top of that hill, he would not be dead. You know, and so it's like, have you not read the Book of Mormon? It's like, well, there's nothing wrong with conversations. God says that we should have a conversation. It's like, what? Did you not? Do you not know who Lahontai is? Do you, do you, I mean, apparently you just woo. You, you you miss that. You know, the whole point of that is you don't come off your hills. Literally, the whole point of this is is you don't come off your hills to talk to Amalekias. You don't do it because. Even if the first interaction was pleasant, even if you meet him and he's like, you know what? I just want you to be king. I just want you to be ruler. I just here to support you. You do not know what's going on in their heart. You do not know. They want to kill you. They want to poison you. They want to get gain from you, right? That's what these people do. And, um, you, ju you just can't come down off your hill, man. You just can't come down off your hill. You're going to get poisoned by degrees, and you're not going to know. People around you aren't going to know. You're just going to slowly die and be like, whatever happened to, to, to Joe Blow? Whatever happened to him? You know? And then what? Did, did the, 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 the person who did the poisoning, does he ever get blamed? Do the Gileadis ever really get blamed? Even though we can all go back to when did this downward trend to apostasy start? Oh, it went. it's when they went off their hill and started listening to Gileadi. And then all of a sudden they were convinced that, oh, the church was in a state of apostasy. And then they left. That's weird. But don't look into it. I, you know, Lahontai started to get sick around the time that Amalekiah came into camp. But let's just not put two and two together. You know, let's not realize that Amalekiah was the one who poisoned him slowly by death. No, 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 no. We, we don't know what's in Amalekiah's heart, you know? We don't know. I mean, he's a good guy. He just, he, he, he do you, are you not listening to what he said? He said he wanted Lahontai to be the, the head honcho. Like, so no, you're just, you're just, you're just reading any things you shouldn't. So one of the greatest, one of the greatest examples of once again, priestcraft, you, you don't, need to have conversations with these people you don't need to listen to what they're saying you don't don't go down off your hill it's garbage and they will poison you by degrees period yep yep i'm into that all right final insight boys let's do it and 
just reading what this is about again, um, it's kind of funny because it's just more of the same, more more comparisons. And basically, this week it's just a lot of cool things to learn about and uh, uh, you know to find in in the example of Moroni, and I guess not in the example of Amalekiah. Um, anyway, there's a couple of cool things in here. So, just going to start with a couple more comparisons between Amalekiah and Moroni. In Alma 48, uh, and thus he did appoint chief captains of the Zoramites, this is Amalekiah, they being the most acquainted with the strength of the Nephites and their places of resort and the weakest parts of their cities. Therefore, he did appoint them to be chief captains over his armies. So Satan knows our strengths and weaknesses, and he will employ tactics that will avoid our strengths and dig at our weaknesses, right? Exactly what Amalekiah did. He took the guy, he took people that knew he knew the weakest parts of, of the Nephites' whole place, and he stuck them at the top of his head of his armies so that they could, um, you know, find those weaknesses and exploit them. And that's what Satan will do to us, so just something to be aware of. Um, and now it came to pass that while Amalekiah had thus been obtaining power by fraud and deceit, we kind of covered this, Moroni, on the other hand, had been preparing the minds of the people to be faithful unto the Lord their God. And thus he was preparing to support their liberty, their lands, their wives, their children, and their peace that they might live unto the Lord their God, that they might maintain that which was called by their enemies the cause of Christians. So the cause of Christians is at the core, it's freedom and family, right? And and freedom of religion. And I feel like today we are standing with the same cause of Christians that they were and having to stand against those who are ready to take away or minimize freedom and family right in front of our eyes, honestly. Never before has a contrast between liberalism and conservatism been so clear so i just want to sort of say that um i hope it's clear particularly in america to everyone who's who's watching the mess that's taking place right now uh i think never before has it been so important to sort of note note that difference and to make some good decisions uh especially leading up to election season um and the Lamanites were astonished, and this, I, I talked about this in the first, the first, my first insight. The Lamanites were astonished because of the armor that they wore, right? And what's what's funny is now they rock up. So they, so Moroni was able to shock the Lamanites. Never before had they seen armor. Essentially, he's like, what the heck? All of a sudden, they've got armor, and they're all they're all you know girded up. He's he manages to shock them a second time. Verse 8, but behold, to their uttermost astonishment, they were prepared for them in a manner which never had been known among the children of Lehi. Now they were prepared for the Lamanites to battle after the manner of instructions of Moroni. So Moroni, second time. Now why? Because he's a righteous guy, because the Lord will help him. The Lord will fortify him. He's probably given him these ideas. He was able to fortify all of his strongholds. Um, and so the Lamanites had been shocked by his armor at one point. And then, by the way, the Lamanites end up rocking up with armor on, right? Um, later on, they 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 copied them and end up coming with armor. Um, and um, but again, still outmatched by the Lord and um, with the things that He guided Moroni to do. Um, I just want to see if it's worth reading this because I don't want to keep going on forever about the same things. Um, basically, I, I covered a bit here about you know, so essentially, they fortified their strongholds by digging the digging the ditches, putting the, the the dirt on top, building their fences and such. And Amalekiah, not caring about his people at all, right, started throwing his men against these walls, you know, and they're getting wrecked by slings and stones and arrows until they're filling the ditches with the bodies of, of their guys. And um, not a single Nephite was slain, right? So I think I said a thousand Lamanites died this way and not a single Nephite died, right? This is This is how cool and how good their defenses were and how much the Lord will protect us as we're righteous and strive to be uh, righteous. And again, what's our intention to defend our religion and our freedom and our liberty and our families. Um, so when, yeah, so we are safe and we fortify ourselves against Satan and stay in our fortifications. The Lord provides those means and the methods that we cannot think of ourselves, even to the point that things that have never been before seen. Um, and th that reminds me of what is to come between now and the second coming, things that we will never have before seen, the most mightiest and craziest miracles to come, um, the Lord will make happen, you know, things we cannot think for ourselves. As long as we're righteous, right, these will be things that um, we'll be blessed to behold and to be a part of. And now this is this is the last part of this. These are some practical things that we can learn from Rono's defenses and um so I'll just quickly brush through this. It's, this is from Alma 50. Now, 
Uh, Marona did not stop making preparations for war. He kept working. He kept working. He didn't stop. He didn't, he, you know, he knew he had to defend. He did not stop preparing. Um, he used his time wisely. He kept working. He kept preparing. And, you know, we can take many uh, lessons from that. We need to cons constantly prepare ourselves, keep working. So they uh, would dig up heaps of earth round about all their cities. Uh, upon these tops of these ridges of the earth, he caused that there should be timbers, yea, works of timbers built up to the height of a man around about the cities. He caused upon those works of timbers, there should be a frame of pickets built upon the timbers around about. They were strong and high. And he caused towers to be erected that overlooked those works of pickets. And he caused places of security to be built upon those towers uh, that stones and arrows of the Lamanites could not hurt them. Um, and he put people in them, right? People to to be able to look out and to um, shoot stones and arrows back without being hit. Thus, Moroni did prepare strongholds against the coming of their enemies around about every city in all the land. Again, never never before seen. Really, really cool. Thus, Moroni, with his armies, which did increase daily because of the assurance of protection which his works did bring forth unto them, his continual works provided assurance of protection, which means meant that his armies increased daily. There's a lesson in that itself, that um, as we continue to work, uh, our work will bring the assurance of protection, the assurance of guidance, the assurance of whatever you need, um, and um, increase our, you know, he's increasing his, his army. We can increase our faith. We can increase whatever it is that we need. Um, yeah, so... Do, 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 do. Mar yeah, so I'll just basically explain this. Moroni's armies increased daily because of the assurance of protection that their works brought unto them. They didn't sit around praying to the Lord for protection. They got out there and they fortified what they have. M. Russell Ballard in 2004, in a talk called Be Strong in the Lord, said, I say that because it has been my experience, there is not one great and grand thing we can do to arm ourselves spiritually. True spiritual power lies in numerous small acts woven together in a fabric of spiritual fortification that protects the sh protects and shields from all evil. And I thought that kind of applies here. So now the reason I'm, I'm talking about this, um, I, to this day, remember this from my mission. This is why it stuck out to me. Um, I remember listening to a talk on my mission from John, by the way, and say what you will about John, by the way, he's, you know, he, I guess you could say he's a bit of a priest crafty kind of guy, but he's, you know, anyway, I listened to a talk called Righteous Warriors by him and it's, I've never forgotten it. It was, it was that sort of, um, stood out to me that much on my mission. And he talked about this. He talked about Morono's defenses and I've never forgotten it. And um, it actually really was one of the things that helped me gain an appreciation for the war chapters to help realize that, you know, there, there, there is value in them. And again, so I can see why people don't find the value, but it's because they haven't really studied to see the value. <clears throat> the war chapters are filled with value. And this isn't what, for, for like verbatim what he said. This is what I recall that he said. And, um, so something to learn from these these chapters I just talked about with the, the digging of the, the ditches and the earth and the timbers and the uh, pickets and the towers, right? So essentially, we need to pray as if everything depended on God, but work like it depends on us and put in that work and do this, do this stuff. Power, as Elder Ballard says, power comes in numerous smaller acts woven together, right? So we can start with something simple like prayer. Which could be digging these ditches and 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 putting this 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 earth in heaps, and these ditches alone that that's not enough, right? Prayer is not enough, but we need to heap the earth on top, study the scriptures, you know, pray, study the scriptures, and then we need to build a breastwork of timbers on that heaped earth, right? Which we could say is like meeting together often at church, going to the temple, being together in zona bust, building each other up, right? Building a strong thing of timbers, right, like a wall on top. Um, but that's still not enough. We need to build pickets on top of these timbers so that they're sharp and pointy and protected like we like we are by living our covenants, right? We make covenants and we need to make sure we live them and we're keeping the com commandments and we're keeping our covenants. And then finally, we build towers and we put people in those towers round about on top of these on top of these mounds of earth, these, this framework of, of timbers, these pickets on top, and we put towers up there um, and we put people in these towers so that they can see far off and defend us from the towers. And we have prophets who can see and guide us um, from these towers. And we ourselves can be watchmen who defend Zion and righteousness from these towers as well. Um, whilst fortifying their cities and living righteously, the Nephites also prospered and became rich, it said. right. So they actually, whilst doing all this work, became rich. And it says they were never happier. 
um, verse 22, 23. And those who were faithful and keep the commandments of the Lord were delivered at all times, whilst thousands of their wicked brethren have been consigned to bondage and or to perish by the sword or to dwindle in unbelief and mingle with the Lamanites. But behold, there was never a happier time among the people of Nephi since the days of Nephi than in the days of Moroni. Yea, even at this time in the 20 and first year of the reign of the judges, while the Lamanites are throwing themselves against their ditches and their walls and their pickets and getting wrecked, um, the people of Nephi working to defend themselves and their freedom and their families and their religion and doing all this work and building their their strongholds and, and all this, there was never a happier time. And uh, there may, may have been a pro more prosperous time, but it says they became rich during this time as well. Um, so that can relate to us as well in, in that doing all this work, you know, studying the scriptures, praying, make sure we do the basics, going to the temple, going to church, being around like-minded people, trying to build a Zion-like people, um, and listening to the prophet in the tower and, and being watchmen ourselves can lead to us never being happier, you know, being the happiest that we can ever be, um, as we're as we're becoming the people the Lord needs us to be, and I just want to finish off that that that's my insight. And the last thing that I'll say is, and this is very interesting, and um, I've left I've left a link in the document document here. Um, I just want to note that, and this is just a side interest because it's cool that they have found many 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 examples of these forts with dug ditches, mounds of earth. Um, the mounds are often, you know, washed away now, but there are ditches and um uh remainders of wood and 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 forts basically fortifications all through north america and the palmyra temple literally sits inside a fort and they date these forts back to the exact time period of the nephites and um so that's just really cool i've left a link here with which has a playlist in it which shows many many examples of these forts they're found all through north america and for some reason never mentioned by archaeologists or mainstream things but they do exist and for anyone who says there's no evidence of the Book of Mormon, there is absolutely tons and tons and tons of it. So anyway, there's spiritual things for us to learn here, but I just want you to know there is really cool physical evidence of all of this as well, um, which I loved learning about. And that is my insight. Well, this quote from M. Russell Ballard. Through spiritual power lies the numerous smaller acts woven together in a fabric of spiritual fortification that protects and shields from all evil. And when I think about that in combination with these chapters, I think that there is, there'd be a lot of well-meaning people that hadn't fortified themselves spiritually to the point where they would be subject to the trials and tribulations of that time period, the wars and the issues. And then I reflect on myself and I say to myself, how can I be the Alma group? rather than the Limpi group? How can I be prepared in advance before the, the, everything goes haywire and the Lord has to come out in his fierce anger and punish the wicked and, and, and punish the righteous for their wickedness? Um, how can I be the one that gets away in the group of Alma? What can I do now that when the bad times kick off, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to leave? I know that the Lord is going to provide an escape for his people, design the new Jerusalem before things get to a point around the world where there is no turning back for the righteous, where there is no safety for the righteous, where there is no escape for the righteous. <clears throat> so how can I be prepared so that in that day that that option becomes available or in preparation for that option becoming available, I can keep myself and my family safe and secure enough for that option to to be made made to me and and so that's where my mind starts to go and so there's work to be done just like you were sharing from those scriptures we need to continue to dig we need to continue to throw up our protective zones we need to continue to work and prepare and never stop preparing Yeah, and I love I love the comparison once again to the the spiritual battle, because uh, like this this is like like I just went, was going over my point. This is a this is a spiritual battle. This is a this is a um, priestcraft battle. And I couldn't help but but as you were going through this, just r like going through just everything that's happened over just the last four years with this, this the priestcraft battle where. 
you will never be able to match. You will never be able to match the spiritual power of an of an individual uh, not practicing priestcraft. You'll ne- if you're practicing priestcraft, you'll never be able to match that spiritual power. Will you be able to say some true things every once in a while? Oh, sure. Will you be able to to make some? Oh, sure. I'm sure there is right. Um, the 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 Lord uses unrighteous people to to do His work all the time, right? So I'm sure it can happen, okay, but you'll never be able to match the shock and awe that that was done by Moroni here, where they show up and it's like, whoa, what what is this? The the spiritual shock and awe of somebody who actually believes these things has obtained um, uh, the power of the Lamb to 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 such a degree that they can stand forth and testify of these things. You'll never be able to match that. And then what ends up happening? Those priest crafters try to imitate it. They try, well, let's go try to get some armor ourselves. Let's go back and try to steal this. Let's try to, uh, and they just can't do it. They just can't mimic it. You'll never be able to mimic that grace that you obtain by, by doing things the right way by by Christ because he's the enabling power. And then it says here, Moroni did increase daily because of the assurance of protection, which his works did bring forth unto them. And I thought, well, there it is, because there it is. Because you go to 35 chapter, um, 35 chapter 7, what do we read uh, about Nephi and his brother, right? And it came to pass that that they, and Nephi did minister with power and great authority, right? Wait, that's the verse before. Nephi did minister with power and great authority, and there was so much good that that Nephi and his brother did that uh, I, we can't even write all about it. They would just fill all these books. And it came to pass that they, the enemies uh, of Nephi or Moroni, very similar, you'll see this, were angry with him, even because he had greater power than they. For it were not possible that they could disbelieve his words. You have so much shock and awe, so much power that you can't even disbelieve it anymore. For so great was his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ that angels did minister unto him daily and and what did it say here it said they did increase daily right they did increase daily and uh i i think that you can you can see clear parallels between those two and uh and how uh if we we go from what we go from these war chapters into directly into nephi and heal and uh, bringing us home into the second coming Perfect example. Nice. Oh, we're dancing. We're dancing. I'm dancing. I'm dancing. All right. Claptrap is ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for taking the time to listen to us today and for, for being a part of this. Brothers and sisters, we just feel so blessed to be alive today. Uh, being able to talk about these things, being able to, to be a part of this. Um we know that these are the days in which the Lord will perform his most wonderful works. We know that these are the days directly before the second coming of our Lord and Savior. Um, we know that. And um, we are simply just doing everything we can to prepare ourselves, prepare the world for the Savior's second coming, to be those people that President Nelson committed us to become, the people that are worthy, able, ready to rejoice, to live the higher, holier laws, the people who will be called upon to redeem Zion, we're just trying to do everything we can to do that because we are Zion or bust or as President Taylor or President Brigham Young have said the kingdom of God or nothing. Right. We know that the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints is the Lord's church. It's not man's church. And uh, we're glad to be part of it. We testify of that. If you're interested in learning more, you can check us out on Discord or on Facebook. Links are always provided down below, which we I can never point. We can never point the right way. Share your insights with us. Help us uh, be edified together. Help us to to keep up the spiritual momentum. We love you. Zion Zion cannot be built up without a group of righteous saints. That's you coming together, coming together, trying to be one, trying to unite our hearts together in in love and unity, preaching the word of God to each other without money, without price, trying to um, do all that we can do to prepare the world for the Savior's second coming. We are... The, the <laughs> three, three brothers.
Rollers. And we love you. Love you guys. Love you. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs>